Hey guys, Will here. So today we are taking a much anticipated look at the Vario Aero VR headset. Now this is gonna be a first look style video, not a full review. This is a prototype unit that they've sent across. We'll explain some of the details around that in just a moment. But today we're gonna to be taking a look at this unit from the perspective of a sim racer, seeing whether this is a major leap forward in terms of VR technology for sim racing. And yeah, give you our impressions and I guess set some expectations around this product from what we expect to see once this goes full release. So. Let's get going. So there's been a huge amount of hype around this headset over the last couple of months. This is a company which is known for sort of medical and industrial grade VR technology, which is extremely expensive and not really suited to the consumer market. There are expensive annual subscription fees that you needed to pay to enable features and things like that. So what we can think of this as being is basically an adaptation of the key elements of the technology, which is intended for medical and industrial use, brought across into a more accessible consumer type product. So we don't have things like subscription fees to pay to run one of these, although the barrier to entry is still admittedly quite high at 1990 US dollars or euros. So it's not a cheap headset by any means. So obviously our expectations for the quality that we're gonna be getting out of this are very high based on the price point. But that said, it is a lot cheaper than you know a medical or industrial grade headset would be. And this kind of flow down effect is obviously really great for consumers because it means that we're seeing that technology become cheaper and cheaper, the barrier to entry becoming lower and lower. Now, as mentioned at the top of the video, this is a prototype unit. We don't know exactly what is going to change between what we have in our hands here today and what you guys will be getting your hands on if you order one of these. So what we're gonna to do today is just run through this headset in top level detail and give you a basic understanding of what the experience is like as it stands right now. We'll then of course revisit with a full review once we know exactly what the final production units are gonna be like, get our hands on one and are able to do more extensive testing. Now there are a lot of really interesting features both from a hardware and software perspective on this headset. So let's start off by taking a run through the hardware here. So the first thing that I noticed as soon as I took this out of the box is it is very, very light, particularly compared to the Pimax 8KX, which I was using just a couple of days ago. So this weighs in at, and I've just got a little cheat sheet here in front of me so I don't get any of these details wrong. 487 grams for the headset itself, plus 230 grams, including the counterweighted headband. So we do have some counterweighting going on here to make sure that this sits correctly on your head. And that is extremely important as we'll see a little bit later on in the video. The unit does use outside in tracking, so we will need some light houses and it uses Steam VR 2.0 or 1.0 lighthouses. So that is an additional cost that you'll be putting on top of the cost of the headset. And if you want hand controllers, those are gonna cost you extra as well. So in terms of the external appearance here, a couple of things that do stand out. I really like the fact that it has this plate on the top here, which is gonna sit and balance it on top of your head as well. One of the complaints that I had with the Pimax 8KX was that there was a lot of weight on the bridge of my nose. And obviously that's gonna depend on your, uh, your anatomy, but having the weight sort of primarily resting on the top of your head and supported by the back of your head should theoretically make the headset feel quite a lot lighter on your face. So we'll comment on that once we get up and running in just a moment, but I do really like that. I also like the fact that it uses this kind of pleather material here as well, which is relatively non-porous compared to something like a cloth. That means that you can easily wipe this down with an antibacterial wipe or something like that. Obviously important at the moment with uh, the pandemic situation, if you're using this in a you know public sort of setting, but also just so it doesn't get stinky and gross over time, fabric you know absorbs dead skin cells and sweat and things like that. It can just get gross over time. Whereas with this, you can give it a quick white clean and it's nice and fresh and ready to go again. So we can see it does have this kind of cloth material around the outside here. And then we can see these little cooling vents here as well. Now, one of the really interesting things about this headset is it does have active ventilation. So there's a little cooling fan in there that actually passes air through and around your face as you're wearing the headset. So we'll comment on how that works once we're up and running as well. The front face plate is a reflective material, obviously to allow infrared light to pass through, I would presume. On the left-hand side here, you can see a little headphone jack. Now the documentation on their website does state that the retail versions of these headsets will come with some sort of headphones and microphone system, which you can plug in. Uh, the uh, prototype version that we have here didn't come with that, so I can't comment on that at all at this point in time, but we do have the 3.5 mil jack there, which you can jack in and obviously use this device as an audio interface, or of course you can just use the audio coming out of your PC via another audio interface device. So that is all good. On the right hand side here, we have a couple of buttons as well, which we'll take a look at in the software interface in just a moment, a little indicator light there too. And that is pretty much everything in terms of the external device, little knobs here for adjustment on your head. They feel like they're metal and they have a really nice feeling to them. They're nice and smooth as you turn them. Just everywhere that you look on this thing, it just feels 
very expensive and very premium, which obviously we would expect for the price point. So having a look on the inside of the headset now, you can see the aspherical lenses that they're using here. So we're not using Fresnel lenses for this. And there's a couple of good reasons for that, which we'll explore once we get into the full review a little bit later on down the track. But you don't see those little lines on the lenses like you get with Fresnel lenses. Obviously you don't see those when you're wearing the headset anyway, but that is an obvious difference there. Behind those lenses, of course, we have two mini LCD LED panels with a resolution of 2880 by 2720 pixels per eye. Uh, just reading off my cheat sheet here again now. Brightness calibrated to 150 nit. Colors calibrated with a coverage of 99% sRGB as well and a native refresh rate of 90 hertz per panel. So one of the really interesting things about this is it also does have integrated eye tracking. Now there's a couple of really useful uses for that. One of those is for automatic IPD adjustment and if we unplug the USB connection here just quickly and then plug that back in you'll actually see there we go, plug it in. It sounds quite cool as well. <laughs> you can see those little lenses moving left and right. So what happens is when you put the headset on and you'll see this in the software in just a moment, it picks up the position of your pupils and adjusts the lenses to suit your uh, your spacing between your pupils or your IPD, which is really, really cool. The other really great use for eye tracking is of course, things like uh, VRSS, but we'll explore that in just a moment too. So the supported IPD range is 57 to 73 millimeters and we have a horizontal field of view of 115 degrees as well. So one degree more than we have with the HP Reverb. G2. And when I put the headset on, it does look pretty much exactly the same. So I think that's pretty much everything we need to cover just at a top level in terms of hardware. A nice flexible cord as well as one other thing that I did notice. It does have a single USB-C connection which you can plug directly into a uh, 20 series graphics card, the ones that had the uh, USB-C connection on them. If you have a 30 series, those of course don't have that USB-C connection. So you will need to use the included interface box which has a display port connection as well as a USB connection on it and a power supply. One other thing I did notice is that the cable is relatively thin and nice and flexible as well. So you don't feel too heavily tethered when you're wearing the headset. So let's pop this up on my head now. And the first thing you're gonna get presented with here is a calibration. So it says, move your head. It kind of tells you where it needs to be positioned on your face. So I'm gonna get that position correctly, tighten up the back. And as I said before, that adjustment does feel very natural on the back of your head. It clamps on quite nicely. Now it's saying out calibration unsuccessful, that's because I was still moving things around on my head there. So one of the things that I would suggest, and this may be something that we see in the five, final version of the software is the ability to allow you to adjust things around before it actually tries to do the calibration would probably be sensible just so you don't run into that issue. But let's just quickly run through and recalibrate again. There we go. So eye tracking calibration, press any button on the headset to continue. Look at the dot. So I'm staring at the dot, moving it down. And there we go. So we should be nicely calibrated now. Headset sitting very comfortably on my head. And one of the things I noticed straight away is just how light and comfortable this does feel. I can feel that slight air movement coming through past my eyes. It does feel a little bit uh, disconcerting just having that air movement, it's no different from, you know, being outdoors with airflow or being in an air conditioned room or something like that, but just having it so close to my face like that does feel a little bit strange. It certainly doesn't feel like it's, you know, putting any pressure on my eyes or anything like that. It's not like one of those pressure tests that you have done at the uh, optometrist or anything like that, but definitely am aware of the presence of that air movement. So it'll be really interesting to see how that influences when we go for longer driving sessions. But just looking around, on the virtual desktop here. I'm just gonna bring up the overlay quickly by pressing the side button, the menu button. And we can see we get this little overlay here so we can go reposition your virtual desktop. So we'll go click and there we go. Now our virtual desktop is right in the middle. We can align ourselves and then click another button and that is gonna align it perfectly for us. So having a look around on the little screen here, I'm just gonna minimize OBS here as well so we're not all looking at the same thing twice. So inside the software interface here, this is basically what I'm seeing over here. And then obviously this is the eyeball tracking going on too. Now, one of the really interesting things that we can do here is if we click on gaze dot, that little dot there is actually tracking where my eyes are looking on the screen. So as I look around, you can see that is moving, which is really cool. And I can see quite a few 
uh, potential usage cases where we could actually use that to track where our eyes are looking as we drive around a track on a racetrack. So this could be really interesting and really useful for creating some training materials and things like that. So that's definitely something that I'm very excited to explore a little bit further on down the track. Now, one thing I do notice straight away, and I've watched a couple of other reviews of these headsets, um, which mentioned a couple of limitations around uh, barrel distortion as well as chromatic aberration. Now, barrel distortion is the effect of sort of the, this, the screen warping towards you, almost like you're looking at a sphere rather than a flat two-dimensional surface. Now, when I'm looking at a relatively two-dimensional static image, we do get a little bit of that barrel distortion effect going on. So if I move the headset up and down, I can see the image kind of warping up and down, which kind of indicates that that is going on. But if the headset is fixed in a clean and tidy position right in the middle, it's not where it's not moving around, it's clamped onto my face nice and solidly. You know, if I'm moving my head around and bouncing my head around, I'm not seeing that distortion effect taking place. And it's not really something that I'm noticing just looking around like this. What I do notice is quite heavy distortion around the outer extremities of the, um, of the field of view. So that last sort of five degrees or so there is quite a lot of warping going on. And a good example of this is if I look up at the top of the building here, you can see that sort of A-frame structure, which I'm looking at. What I'm actually seeing there is if I move my eyes down, just so that is just at the top of my field of view there, that actually warps away. So I actually don't see the point at all. What I see is it kind of just sweeps away into the distance and it bends out completely. So within the sweet spot of the field of view, the picture is incredibly clear and I'm not I, I can barely make out the individual pixels at all. I think the uh, the dots per square inch or the PPI is actually finer than it is with the Pimax 8KX simply because the field of view is less. So even though the panel resolution is lower on this headset than it is with the 8KX, because the panels themselves are physically smaller, the PPI or pixels per inch is less than it is with the Pimax. So that results in a crisper, clearer image with even less screen door effect than we had with the 8KX, which, you know, was barely any screen. I mean, I, I, I described it as not really being a screen door effect at that point, because it's not something that draws you away from the experience. It's just that you are, you are aware that you can see the individual pixels. Whereas with this, I really do have to focus my attention 100% to see pixels at all. And just looking around and, you know, navigating around generally, it's incredibly clear. So before we talk about image quality and those things too much, let's just have a little bit of a look around in the software here. Now, one of the things I do really like is that I can actually do this while I'm wearing the headset here. So it's kind of all happening live. Because we have this virtual desktop interface, it actually makes this really easy. So we can see here, we've got buttons for calibrating our eye tracking, our action button, our menu button. We've got a button here for headset view and eye camera as well. So if we click on eye camera, that switches that off and we've got just the headset view. We switch the eye camera back on we can see that as well. That's actually quite freaky seeing my eyes <laughs> responding like that. It's amazing how quickly your eyes do twitch when they change positions like that. It's not something that you get to see very often, but it's really cool when you do. So under the headset tab, we've got an adjustment here for our interpupillary distance. And that is, as I mentioned before, automatic. If we switch that off, we can manually adjust that too. But switching it back on, you can see there, it's gonna trigger the automatic adjustment again. And that is really cool how that happens because it, it, you know, basically what it's doing is essentially making sure that what you're seeing is the best quality image possible, provided that you do have this mounted on your head correctly. And we'll talk about the importance of that again a little bit later on once we get into looking around in Google Earth. So underneath that, we have an adjustment for our image quality, resolution quality, and you can see foveated 39 ppd. Now foveated basically means that it's adjusting the resolution to make sure that you're seeing the highest resolution possible right within the sweet spot of your vision or where you're actually focusing your gaze. And then as you move around, the areas that are outside of your gaze are reduced in resolution. And I assume that that is the reason why we actually see a lower resolution reported here than what we have as the native panel resolution, even though we have it set to our maximum or our highest adjustment here of 39 PPD. So that is definitely something that I'll clarify before we get into the full review there, because that is a little bit confusing, the fact that we don't have an adjustment here where we can just set it to native panel resolution. So that is one of the ways that the eyeball tracking is integrated into the software. So wherever you're gazing or wherever that attention is focused, the foveated resolution will adjust depending on where you're looking. So that obviously does depend on game integration. Unfortunately, none of the SIM titles at this point in time, at least when we're making the video, do 
have uh, VRSS enabled. Uh, VRSS is, or VRSS 2.0, I should say, takes uh, makes usage of eyeball tracking within VR headsets or HMDs within a game environment. So we can't actually demonstrate that for you today, but again, hopefully a little bit further on down the track, that's something that we'll be able to check out as well. Uh, we've got adjustments here for V-Sync as well as motion prediction. Now, one thing I have noticed here, uh, particularly compared to the Pimax 8KX, which we tested just recently, the general motion does seem to be quite smooth. So there's obviously some sort of filtering or interpolation that's going on here. Little fine movements don't seem to be quite so jerky as they were with that particular headset. Now, obviously that will depend on how you have your lighthouses set up around the room and things like that as well. So obviously the experience is gonna vary there depending on how things are set up. And again, that's something that we'll explore in our full review. Now we've got a tab here for presentation. We've got a couple of different background scenes which you can choose from. We've got a cabin which obviously you can see here in the background behind my virtual desktop. We've got a grid pattern as well, which is similar to the Steam VR that I'm sure a lot of you will be used to, but we're gonna change it back to cabin for now. Disable headset buttons if you wish to do so, disable notifications in headset, eye tracking instructions, and also a button here for optimizing performance, which allows us to shut down the system processes that are not required by your application. So that might actually be a sensible thing to switch on just for now. If we can click across to workspace, Enable virtual desktop, so if we switch that off, you can see now that has disappeared, but we're gonna click it back on again for now. Application background, we can enable our hand controllers within the virtual space as well. I don't actually have any hand controllers on here, because again, we are testing this in the context of sim racing. Virtual desktop shortcut button, a configuration tool for setting up the parameters around our virtual desktop, and we can run through the uh, initial setup process here as well. So should we wish to start over. So then under system, we can trigger Steam VR room setup, pair additional VR devices, override origin and detection, enable compatibility for open VR and open XR, and a couple of other general settings here as well. Interestingly, you can actually switch off eye tracking. It says that foveated rendering will still remain active, but the tracking data isn't available to any external applications. Now, I don't really see why anybody would be precious about not having their eyeballs tracked because I don't really like, well, what, how are you gonna use that information? But the options there, should you wish to switch it off. So then under support, we've got the current software versions, automatically check for updates. We can flash firmware and do all those sorts of things. There's a manual update button here as well if you wish to flash specific firmware. And then we've got our basic troubleshooting options down here as well. So again, we'll, we'll explore this once we get into final production and uh, we know that this is exactly what you guys are gonna be getting your hands on as well. But look, overall, a very, very clean interface. I, I really like how this is presented. I love the virtual desktop system as well. And you know, having now sat here for a good few minutes running through this, it is very comfortable to look at. I'm already adjusting to the need to kind of turn my head around rather than using my eyeballs to look around the screen. I don't think for me, this is something that I would use in place of a monitor. I don't think that I would wanna use VR for doing things like Photoshop and you know video editing, things like that, web browsing. But the fact that I can navigate around my desktop and do all the things that I need to do quickly without having to take the headset off constantly is definitely a very big positive there. Now you can do virtual desktop inside Steam VR as well, of course, but I do like the native presentation that we have where we can see as well headsets connected, our two lighthouses are detected. And then we also have the ability here to record and take screenshots natively within the application as well, which is quite cool. So I'm gonna pop this off again just for a moment now. Oh, there's the real world. <laughs> it is actually, it's really, really comfortable to wear. That's something that is really impressing me. I'm, I mean, I've had this on my head for a good 10, 15 minutes now. I'm not feeling any pressure on my nose at all. Very, very comfortable. And that airflow through the display as well does seem to take away some of that claustrophobia that I sometimes do get from wearing VR headsets as well. So I'd say, you know, at least for a first impression that has really, you know, that's really, they've really nailed that aspect as well. But we'll talk about that a little bit more when we get up and do some driving soon. But what I'm gonna do now is open up one of the demo applications which they included with the uh, reviewers package. We'll take a look around in there, then we'll have a look in Google Earth and we'll get up and do some sim driving. So what we have here is a demo set inside an art studio which has a lot of three dimensional detail and it's really cool just sort of having the headset on and feeling like you're really inside this environment with all the stereoscopic 3D stuff going on around you. Now, in an environment like this, the thing that you do notice straight away is that you do have a far more restricted field of view than you have in real life. So obviously it does feel like you're looking through a letterbox, so to speak, but you know, whether, whether or not it's important to you is purely just gonna depend on the types of games that you're playing and what you expect from a VR experience, but it's definitely a noticeable thing. And the other thing that I'm noticing straight away 
is that you do get some distortion around the outside. Now, the sweet spot in terms of visual clarity is quite large here, so I can look around quite comfortably, and it's only really on the outer extremity, so the last maybe 10 degrees or so that I'm starting to get into some distortion. And similar to what we described with the 8KX headset as well, what happens is the things on the outside of the image kind of just warp away. So I can certainly identify with what people were saying about barrel distortion, but what I would say is that it's not like the entire image is distorted throughout. If I move the headset around, I do see the image warping a little bit, but as long as the headset is staying stable on my head and it's not moving around at all, I'm not noticing, you know, things looking distorted within the usable range of my field of view. It's just that kind of outside extremity area that where it starts to look a little bit funny. So if I look around outside the window, for example, everything looks nice and square. I'm not seeing any weird, you know, warping or anything funny going on in any straight lines. Let's walk around the environment a little bit here now too. just move around. I guess the things that are standing out is just how natural the colors look. And I mean, I am colorblind, so I do need to disclose that. I'm probably not the best judge of that, but I mean, what I see through the headset compared to what I see in the real world is very, very, very close. I don't see an overly saturated image. I don't see under-exaggerated or over-exaggerated blacks. Everything just looks very, very, very accurately reproduced, which to me is something that's very important because anything like that, which doesn't look realistic, takes away from the immersion and reminds you when you're inside a game that it isn't real. And I can see myself, despite the more restricted field of view that I have with this headset compared to some others, just that clarity is enough that it's going to draw me into the experience and I can really see myself getting lost and, you know, so immersed in the experience that I get lost and forget that I'm actually wearing a VR headset. And because the thing's so comfortable as well, I do just need to make a small adjustment there. I have it sitting a little bit high. There we go. That's a bit better. But yeah, once it's adjusted correctly, you know, it is so light and comfortable that you just don't even notice that you're wearing it. But let's jump into Google Earth and let's have a look at some really wide open landscape and then we'll jump into some sim racing titles. Okay, so Google Earth VR, huge globe right in front of my eyes here. And I definitely do feel like I have tunnel vision with this headset on. So it's definitely having that smaller field of view compared to something like an 8KX. It's definitely, you know, it doesn't have that same immediate wow factor that you have with that despite the, despite the clarity that we're getting here. But when I get in and I look at details on the cities around, this is, absolutely mind-blowing so it's 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 funny because it's like it's a trade-off you're trading off that field of view for clarity in the middle and it, again like i can only speak from what's important to me and what's important to you is going to be different depending on the types of games you're playing or the kinds of experiences that, you, that you're wanting out of vr but it's a shame that you can't have both but at this point in time for me i think i would take this level of clarity over the field of view because i know that my brain will adjust to this field of view and it'll become more natural. But just looking around these settings, I mean, the things that really stand out to me is just the crispness in the optics is absolutely incredible. It's like nothing I've seen before. And, you know, I really, I really, really have to focus hard to make out any pixels whatsoever. Like it, if, if what I was looking at was photorealistic, then it, I would have trouble distinguishing from the real world, which is, you know, pretty incredible when we think of where VR was just a couple of years ago. But in terms of horizons and things like that, barrel distortion, I'm really not noticing it just looking around like this. Like if I move my head up and down or move the headset around on my head, I can see the horizon warping up and down. But, you know, as long as the headset is perched correctly on my head, I just don't see that being a problem. And again, I'm just trying to describe to you guys what I'm seeing in the experience that I'm having so that hopefully when you watch all these different reviews and you kind of you know, getting an understanding of what different people are experiencing based on their own expectations. You can kind of read between the lines and get a clear picture of what it's likely to be for you and your expectation. But, oh, the colors just look so natural. The blacks are so deep and rich. And yeah, it, this, is, this is really something else. This is, I don't like to use the word game changer because I know that it's a bit of a cliche, but this is really something special. Just the way that sunlight glows across. And it's another thing that I'm looking at here as well as a transition in gradients between light blue and dark blue as I look across the sky as well. There's a little bit of banding going on there. I don't know whether that's just native 
to Google Earth rather than something that I'm seeing through the headset. You guys will be able to see from the screen capture whether or not that's present there. So you guys will be able to see that for yourselves. But yeah, the color transitions are really great. I'm really just not seeing anything at all here that stands out as being problematic other than just the fact that you do have that sense that you're looking through a letterbox or a Ned Kelly mask or something like that. But yeah, this is really something special. One thing that I am noticing in high contrast situations, and I noticed this when we were looking around on the virtual desktop before, but it's probably more pronounced now that I'm looking at a scene like this with a really hard edge. And I think the next little screen that we get here as well with the overlay, yeah, there we go. So we've got a, a dark background here with a white bar across the top. Now, if I look straight through the center of the display, everything looks crisp, everything looks absolutely fine. But if I start to tilt my head up, and tilt my eyes down so you guys will be able to see with the um, with the eye tracking what I'm doing here. So I'm tilting my head up and I'm looking down towards the bottom of the panels. What I'm seeing is some chromatic aberration. What I mean by that is separation between the colors and as they're reaching my eye, obviously different colors have different wavelengths and how they travel through a lens varies and how it actually reaches a focal point can vary slightly depending on your position relative to the lens. So when I look down like that, what I'm seeing is a kind of greenish yellow band across the top. And if I go down, I see the same thing again, but a bluish purple band across the top. So what happens is as long as I'm looking through the very center of the screen, I'm absolutely fine. But as soon as I start to sort of move my head around and look at edges like that. So if I look with my head to the left here and aiming my eyes to the right to look at the edge of that screen, I'm seeing a really hard green line down the right hand edge or down the left hand edge of that Google Earth overlay I should say where the gray and um, gray and white areas are and if I do the same on the other side here I'm getting the same thing again as well so it's definitely I can see again looking at that um, looking at that button down the bottom of the magnifying glass the top edge of that looks kind of yellowish green and the bottom half of it looks kind of a purpley blue color so yeah that that is a classic example of chromatic aberration I wouldn't say that it is overpowering but I would say that the slight barrel distortion that you get on the outer edges of the field of view, as well as that chromatic aberration, as well as the restricted field of view that you have at 115 degrees, those are definitely the three key limitations of this headset, at least as it stands right now in prototype form. And, uh, you know, for, for those three reasons, I would say, you know, it's definitely not the perfect VR headset. There's definitely a way to go in terms of the technology. I think if we could have that 8KX field of view without the chromatic aberration, without the slight barrel distortion, but with this level of clarity and, uh, you know, resolution, it would, it would be absolutely incredible. But pop the headset off again now. And again, that's very comfortable. Didn't have any problems with eye strain. Uh, my face still feels nice and fresh. I don't feel sweaty. I don't feel claustrophobic. And uh, yeah, those are definitely things that I can't say for other VR headsets. So definitely happy there. But let's jump into some sim racing titles now. We'll start off with iRacing. Want to, again, like we did with the AKX, check out the uh, frame rate, see what kind of sacrifices we have to make in terms of visual fidelity to get that 90 frames per second to match the native refresh rate of the panels here. And uh, yeah, see what the experience is like in iRacing first. And we'll go into auto Mobilista 2 and Assetto Corsa Competizione. Okay, so sitting in the cabin of a Mercedes W12 F1 car here at Silverstone in iRacing, the first thing that I noticed immediately jumping into a sim is just, again, that visual clarity. This immediately transports me into feeling like I'm sitting in the actual car. Like, it, it's just the amount of immersion that I'm getting here, the level of immersion is just not like anything that I've experienced before, even with the 8KX and even with that extended field of view. What I'm noticing just sitting in the cabin here is that the usable field of view, even just sitting here looking around inside the car and also considering the fact that, you know, you'd be wearing a helmet in the, re in the real world as well, the field of view does actually feel quite natural to me. So I don't feel like I'm missing out on anything just sitting here in the cabin. Now the frame rate at the moment as it sits is about 65 frames per second. That's with the graphics here maxed out in iRacing. Now, one of the things that we will explore when we do the full review is the impact of different hardware on the performance. So we're running a 3090 here with an 11900K running at 5.2 gigahertz clocked on all cores. Um, they recommend at least a 3070 or 2080 graphics card for this headset. So we'll see how the frame rate goes once we're out on track, but let's drive out now one of the things I absolutely love about VR that you just don't get with large triple screens, even like the rig that we have 
is the ability to actually look up and over the cabin, look down at the wheels and spot how things are interfacing. So we can see, for example, if we look down exactly how close our tire is to the ripple strip and so forth. And obviously that's gonna depend on the car that you're driving, but immediately this just feels really, really natural. I did admittedly struggle a little bit adapting to the 8KX and I think it was because I had issues with the screen flickering and a couple of other little problems which we highlighted in the review of that headset and I was able to get those problems sorted out but this I mean we're sitting pretty solidly at about 70 frames per second here with the same graphic settings that were giving us about 60 to 65 with the Pimax so the frame rate again on my specific hardware isn't massively higher than it was with the Pimax 8KX, which is interesting, I thought it might be. But, yeah, I mean, this this is just absolutely insane levels of immersion, and it's all just down to that visual clarity. What I can tell you again is I'm not noticing any sort of barrel distortion in this context either, other than just a little bit of funny business going on right at the very top of my field of view. So if I pay attention to it, I can see the halo above my head kind of warping and distorting right in that last sort of 5% of the field of view. Which is a little bit off-putting if you pay attention to it. But certainly like when you're focusing on the road directly in front of you, it's definitely not something that I'm really noticing or paying attention to. So. But again, just that visual clarity and that nice big sweet spot in terms of not having any visual distortion or lack, lack of focus. I think that's probably one of the big things, actually, now I pay a little bit more attention to it, is the chromatic aberration aside, which I'm not really noticing in this context, to be honest with you unless I really look over right at my mirrors without turning my head. I think one of the outstanding things with this is that the sweet spot in terms of focus is so large. So I'm not getting weird distortion and weird sort of blurring effects going on. And you guys can see from the, uh, from the overlay where I'm looking on the road with the eye tracking. So you get a good sense of where I'm looking in the um, looking in terms of the field of view, but yeah, it just it's really drawing me into the environment. I mean, this is again in eye racing where the graphics aren't that amazing. So I think the best thing to do now is to jump into Automobile Lister Two, which is a really really immersive game anyway, and see what the experience is like there. But yeah, this is, again, I don't like to use the term game changer because I feel like it doesn't leave any more room for improvement. And there definitely is a lot of room for improvement in terms of, you know, just the field of view. It would be, you know, if we could have this level of clarity, but with a massive field of view, it really would be absolutely amazing. But where this is really shining for me just right now in iRacing is just having that clarity, having that you know, immense detail in what I'm seeing really just draws me in. And particularly in a car like this, where you are quite enclosed, you know, you do have barriers quite close to the sides. And you can see that slight bit of near clip, near clipping going on, which unfortunately we can't dial out in iRacing. We have adjusted the I and I file, but it's just always going to be there in this car, I think. But, you know, in an environment where you do feel quite encased in the car anyway, it does feel quite natural. And, you know, you would have to turn your head to sort of glance at the mirrors. And, you know, even just the fact that the, you know, the view in the mirror does move around relative to your head position, all those little things that you don't get with triple screens, when you combine it with this level of visual clarity, it really is something else. And I, I could, and I don't say this lightly, but I could honestly see myself using this headset for sim racing over my triple screens, which is not something that I would say for any other headset that I've tried to date. Obviously for content creation, it's different and we would still use the triple screens for content creation. But yeah, this, 
this really is something else. So let's jump into Automobilista 2 now. Okay, so Automobilista 2 around Bathurst now. I knew this was gonna look good because we tested it with the Pimax AKX recently, but the clarity here is just something else. It really, it's pulling me into the virtual world. <laughs> See if we can stay with this lead bunch here. Just looking around the environment, everything is so clear. I guess the thing that's standing out to me the most here is just how natural the colors look. One of the complaints that I've had about a lot of games in general is just they do tend to have, have a little bit of a cartoonish look to them. And the color reproduction through this headset is just so natural. The contrast between the outside and the inside of the car is fantastic as well. Looking around inside the cabin, got really nice deep blacks. Not quite to the same level as you've had with OLED panels, of course, but very, very close. You can see the particles and the sun ray, the, you know, the sunlight rays and everything shining through as well. They look natural. There's no sort of weird god ray effects going on through the headset or anything like that. It all looks very natural. come down the mountain now try to keep it under control <laughs> to leave space there on the outside I mean it's so much to take in all at once here but it's genuinely scary driving down the mountain there because you're so immersed in what's going on and although like I, you know, I don't, I don't have that field of view that I had with the Pimax 8KX, and it is noticeable. Like, it doesn't have that initial wow factor, potentially, if field of view is your thing. Whoa, big twitch. <laughs> the visual clarity that it gives you is a wow factor in, its, in and of itself. So, for me, personally, I think... I would prefer to have that visual clarity over the field of view because as we said in the AKX review, even though you have the field of view, it's not necessarily usable information because it is blurry outside that area. You do still have to turn your head to actually look at the mirror. It's just like what you have to do here as well. So while it's not quite so immersive in that sense, It is easier to get better performance in Automobilista 2 with this headset than it was with the um, with the Pimax just because of the slight lower resolution. I think we're running into GPU bottlenecks here before we did with iRacing, so didn't have quite such an impact in iRacing. But let me get up the inside here. Yeah, this is just something else. I mean, it's. It's not perfect, and I mean, if I look, if I look over at the mirror there, just to give you an example, I can see a bit of that chromatic aberration going on just on the hard edge of my white mirror there. So it's not perfect, but just looking around inside the cabin, man, my driving's terrible. While I'm trying to concentrate on what's going on and talk and do all those things. Apologies for that, but you know, just looking around inside the cabin, things like the text on the dash there very very clear to read easy to read i can read the text on the right hand side there on the button box too and there's no chromatic aberration going on there so as long as, you, as long as you're within that sort of sweet spot and the sweet spot is quite large with this headset it's very comfortable Yeah, this is uh, this is a game changer for me in AMS2, no question about it. I could very comfortable, comfortably drive like this all day. I'm not noticing, you know, the headset's presence on my head either. It doesn't feel any less comfortable than just wearing a helmet, to be honest. I'm not feeling pressure on my nose, anything like that. This is a really, really, really fantastic experience. So let's jump into ACC now and see how the experience translates there. 
Okay, so Assetto Corsa Competizione now. We've had to make a few adjustments here to our visual quality just to get the frame rate up, as I would expect with this game. Unfortunately, it's not as well optimized for VR as Automobilista 2 is, and as such, to get that frame rate up to an acceptable level where we can drive and you know have things nice and smooth and not jumping around, we have had to introduce some resolution scaling. So what that means is that I am sacrificing that visual fidelity which I enjoyed so much in AMS 2. So it is a sacrifice and I was expecting it to be a necessary sac sacrifice here. But let's just get underway here. Good launch. <laughs> yeah, and it's just having that having that visual fidelity turned down, just having that slight blurriness in the distance. It just takes away from that immersion because it lets you know that you're playing a game. It reminds you that it's not real. Whereas in AMS2, I was really finding that I was just getting lost in the game. So like I can't read the text on the back of those cars in front of me there, for example, but I can read the dash and everything just fine. So it doesn't stop me from seeing the things that I need to see. It's just pulling away from that immersion. Now, if they do integrate VRSS 2.0 into Automobilista 2, which I'm hoping they will, then that would potentially change it. So it is a limitation of the PC hardware. Again, remembering we are running a 3090 here with an 11900K. So the lower the system is that you have, the, the worse this is gonna be for you. So definitely something to be aware of here, but I am definitely having to crank the graphics down quite a bit to get a good experience. Now, the other thing you could do, of course, is reduce the visual quality and increase the uh, or decrease the, the amount of resolution the amount of resolution scaling as well so if you didn't mind having crappy looking shadows or you know dodgy looking textures and no effects and things like that then you could bring back that detail in terms of the crispness but again it's just a trade-off that you need to be aware of but really other than that everything else all the observations that we had in um in ams2 pretty much relate here as well the color clarity is great I can read all the text just fine. And um, yeah, it's a very immersive experience, just not quite as immersive because of those sacrifices that we have to make. So being a prototype unit, I don't want to call this conclusions on the Aero headset because there are still a few things that could change. Uh, but look, as far as the experience stands right now with what we have here in our hands, it is an absolutely amazing headset, as particularly in the context of sim racing where you know, for me, the field of view isn't quite so important as visual clarity. The amount of clarity, the amount of detail that we get in this headset, provided you do have a high-end system to actually allow you to have that amount of detail and still maintain a decent frame rate. This is absolutely amazing. So definitely my favorite headset that I've tested to date for sim racing out of the 8KX and the uh, G1 and G2 HP Reverb headsets. Obviously, it is very expensive as well, though. Far and away the most expensive headset that we've tested here at Boosted Media and more than double the price, well more than double the price of an HP Reverb G2. Does it give you double the experience? Look, really, it's just going to come down to what's important to you. I think if if visual clarity and you know really sort of just immersing yourself in an almost photorealistic environment is what's most important to you, then this is probably the closest that you're gonna be able to get at this point in time, at least in the consumer space. It definitely has more visual clarity in it than the uh, Pimax 8KX does overall. But obviously that is at the sacrifice of that horizontal field of view and vertical field of view as well. It doesn't go as high either. So. What I found with the 8KX by comparison is that when you first put it on, particularly in things like Google Earth, where you know things aren't flying at you so much, you put it on and you're just absolutely blown away by the expanse of what's in front of you. And you know when you put this on, it does feel like you're looking through a letterbox by comparison. And I can imagine for people that are coming from a headset that has a wider field of view than this does, they may be disappointed with it. And again, it's just gonna come down to what you're expecting, what you're wanting out of a headset. But I think for the context of sim racing, which is my specialty, um, you know what this gives you in terms of that quality is more than enough for me to overcome the loss of field of view. And when you consider that that information within that wider field of view isn't necessarily useful anyway because it is blurry with a lot of other headsets, you are you are ultimately having to turn your head to see the detail in those in those areas anyway, which you have to do with this headset too. So when it comes down to 
the actual sweet spot in the visual range is pretty much the same as the 8KX, at least for me. It really just comes down to that extra immersion of having that field of view as opposed to not having the field of view. But I guess to summarize, this is an absolutely exceptionally good headset. I really like how comfortable it is as well. I didn't find that it was cumbersome on my head. I didn't find that I was going, oh, I want to take this off. I want to take this off halfway through a race or anything like that. Um, yeah, I mean, I did have it on my head in the process of recording this review for, you know, over an hour at a time at points and never did it sort of become uncomfortable. Having that airflow through as well was quite comfortable. I didn't find that it ended up drying out my eyes like I thought might be a problem. No different from just being outside or in a room that's air conditioned really. So you do notice it when you first put the headset on uh, and that might be a little bit weird for some people. I didn't notice anywhere in the software the ability to switch it on and off, but you know, I, I don't think it's going to be a problem for anybody unless you suffer from dry eye or something like that. So is this the perfect VR headset and the last VR headset that you're ever going to purchase? I would say probably not. I mean, one of the big things that you are going to have to consider here is the price point. And you know, there are some there's some pretty heavy limitations on this headset still, depend, you know, despite how good it is. So we do have the field of view limitation, which I would love to see increased in the future. We do still have that slight barrel distortion as well, which for me isn't a big deal, particularly in the context of sim racing. I just didn't find that it was something that I noticed, but it may bother some people. And the fact that it is there may be a detractor for some people. We do also have that chromatic aberration as well, which was a little bit worse than I'd hoped it would be with this headset. Uh, it wasn't an issue at all with on the Pimax 8KX, for example. So I think that just comes down to the difference in the optics that are being used here with the spherical lenses as opposed to Fresnel lenses but definitely a limitation there as well and I'd say for me that's probably the biggest limitation that's the one thing that kind of draws me out and you know reminds me that I'm inside a game as opposed to being in reality I kind of found that over time I adjusted to that restricted field of view but the chromatic aberration was something that did still kind of you know grab my attention from time to time. And again, in, in the context of sim racing, really not a big deal, but in any other sort of environment where you're paying attention to fine details, you know, moving around more slowly, and you don't have things rushing at you. I do think that it is something that you will notice. So it's definitely something that I think needs to be called out. But for me, you know, those are the three big areas. And I guess the big question is, you know, if you're gonna be dropping this kind of coin on a VR headset, what's the resale value gonna be like in a couple of years time? Will there be something, you know, a huge leap ahead again in technology in the next couple of years. Will we see those limitations lifted? At this point in time, I just don't know. And I mean, I compare this to where VR was. The first experience I had with VR was my HP Reverb G1, which was just a little bit over two years ago now. And this is a massive leap forward from that. There's absolutely no question there at all. But you know, the fact that things like this exist now do obviously impact the resale value of the older units. And we do have to question when you're spending this kind of money on a headset, you know, in two years time, what kind of money are you going to be able to get for this if you do wish to upgrade again? So if money isn't a thing for you, I would say, yeah, go ahead and buy it, enjoy it for what it is right now. But if you're waiting and, uh, you know, hoping for the ultimate VR headset, I would say we're still not quite there yet. I would say the, the, uh, the, the technology is, I guess, in its adolescence, I would say. I said it was in its infancy a couple of years ago when we tested the G1 and the G2 uh, HP Reverb headsets. I would say it's in its adolescence now, and I'm really excited to see where these things go. But I think what is really awesome here is that we are starting to see that commercial and industrial technology stepping down into consumer grade stuff. And although the price point is still very high, it's definitely a lot more affordable than it was a couple of years ago. So this is definitely a massive leap forward in terms of VR technology. But it's not the absolute ultimate be all and end all VR headset that I know a lot of people were hoping for. And I think it's important to manage that expectation appropriately there as well. So I'm really excited to see what the, uh, what the retail versions of these are like. Hopefully they'll send us one over to check out as well. We will be sending this pre-production unit back and there's a couple more things that I wanna record before we do that. I wanna check out Microsoft Flight Sim. I wanna check out a couple of other VR titles like Boneworks and uh, Half-Life Alex as well. But I wanted to keep this video focused on where my expertise are, which is more within the sim racing side. So hopefully this video has helped you out and answered a lot of your questions. Obviously there are still some questions to be answered given that this is a pre-production uh, prototype unit. But yeah, hopefully this has given you a good understanding if you are looking at pre-ordering one of these, at least a benchmark for what sort of performance you can expect from this unit and what some of those likely limitations are gonna be. So leave a thumbs up if you've enjoyed the video, consider subscribing as well if you haven't already. Obviously we will have a couple more videos coming up on this headset over the coming months. Uh, I'm assuming that we can hold on to it that long, we'll see. But yeah, really impressed with this overall and uh, I'm sure that you guys will be as well. So thank you very much for watching guys. I'll drop some links down in the description for more detail on the headset as well. And uh, yeah, we'll see you again soon. Bye.